have no headphone. Can you still hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay, perfect, wonderful. Um, I'm a 12 year MVP and today I really would like to pick it up where Steve left it from the, from the presentation before. He was talking about testing and how you can make sure that things work right. And now I'll want to introduce a couple of techniques what you can do when things are not working right. So when you don't have the test in place and you have production code that is misbehaving or if you like for situations where you have to explore why maybe a background job or a remote job or a DSC thing just doesn't work. So I'd like to cover different debugging techniques, um, some of which you will probably have already used, maybe not to the extent that is possible, and some of these are really new. I'd like to also dive into the, the new PowerShell 5 features that enable you to do all kinds of uh, funky debugging, let's put it that way. Most of that presentation is a non-slide demo-based presentation. So this is the last slide you're going to see. <laughs> I've, I've prepared these slides for you nevertheless, so you can download the materials later. But now I'm going to switch to my PowerPoint for Geeks, which is obviously I see steroids. Um, and I have this little helper tool on the right side that helps me find my way through my slides. Uh, first of all, we're talking about bugs. So let's open that slide. Before we can talk about debugging, we need to talk about what, what exactly uh, we can target with debugging. And uh, I brought to you one of the first bugs in computer history. Let's see if it shows up. There it is. That was a real bug, and boy did they fix it. <laughs> they really fixed that mock with a piece of tape into a real paper lock file that was 1946 quite a long time ago, we didn't have the Internet of Things, we just had things, <coughs> and bugs could be touched, so it was fairly easy to find these things in the middle of an electrical relay. Well, today it's different. We have virtualized situations where the code by itself wouldn't really show what's wrong. You have to sort of examine it while it's running, and there are three different types of errors that you may encounter. What about the font size? Can you read that, read that in the back? First of all, there are syntax errors. We all know these. They have a red squiggle <coughs> line if uh, something is wrong because the parser that PowerShell uh, triggers when you stream <coughs> code, code characters to it will discover that at that point it doesn't know what to do with your code. And PowerShell, fortunately, wouldn't ex um, execute something if it wasn't 100% sure what you meant. So it wouldn't say, well, I kind of know what, what this guy wants. Let's try it. In this case, if there is a grammar or spelling error, here, some seats over there. Um, then the script would not even run, so this is not the type of error we are going to target here. That's something, that's housekeeping that you need to make sure before you run things. Then we have the typical runtime errors. These are errors that can drive you nuts because your script runs fine when you develop it, but once you deploy to the wild, it's, it doesn't run anymore. One of the more easiest of the more obvious problems you can see here, this would probably run when, the, when I do <coughs> it the first time, and when I do it again, it'll fail. Well, it should fail. See it? Yeah, it did fail the first no, It failed the first time also because I just don't have drive G available. It's already mapped. So that would be a typical thing. And basically, these type of errors would be uh, these type of yeah, error reasons would be the ones that you target with error handling. Much trickier are logical errors. Logical errors don't emit an error. So if PowerShell was a golden retriever, after ex executing that script, golden PowerShell would jump at you, wag his tail and say, hey, wasn't that great? And you'd say, well, kind of. It, the script didn't do what it should. So here, for example, you see one of the many, many things that can go wrong what do you think would line 12 do? Uh, it's, it's not a trick question, so you can answer that. <laughs> so what do you think it does? It, it sim simply tests whether the, the path is available. And that's pretty straightforward. So you wouldn't expect this line to cause any trouble. However, if someone, and people always do these things, someone does something weird, which I'm doing now, do something weird, and then I'm running that again, Oh, sorry, it should do something weird. If it doesn't do something weird, I need to do it by hand, but then you can see what I do, <laughs> okay. Let's do it by hand. So 
I'm changing my current location, and that is again something I didn't want to see here. I know the bug. That's just because I'm in presentation mode, and when in presentation mode, when you start typing, it's the types, the keys are different. So I'm switching to a different location. Now I'm in the registry, and now I'm running the same line again. And now it reports false, although the UNC path didn't change. That's a typical thing. Logical errors are errors where the author of the script <coughs> sometimes didn't exactly know what PowerShell does. So there was room for misunderstandings. And um, the solution here, by the way, would be to understand that in paths, PowerShell always needs a drive letter. If you don't have a drive letter, PowerShell doesn't know which provider can handle that path. And UNC paths tend to have no drive letter. So in this case, PowerShell simply takes the provider of the current location where it is and would now search for this path in the registry, which is not what you want. Does anyone know what, to, what we can do here? Yeah, very good. Simply tell PowerShell what the provider is. And two colons, and then this thing would be always correct. Now into debugging. Let's just assume you have a large script and you have a problem with that script and you'd like to know what's wrong. The first thing is, and that is also, it may appear to you, well, what, what, what's he talking about? That's old school, it's outdated, but it's not. Use write debug statements to emit diagnostic data in your scripts. Because if you do, you can turn on and turn off this um, debug channel whenever you want to. In a production environment, the debug channel is completely without output. So in a production environment, you wouldn't see any data emitted by write debug. You can always enable it when you need it. You do your debug preference. So if you want to run a debug run, simply set that to continue. And also if your script has a common parameter like debug, then you can use that one. That, however, would enable the debug preference inquire. That looks a little bit weird because then all these write debug statements would turn <coughs> into breakpoints. And when you do this, we will dive into more advanced um, technologies in debugging, but that is quite useful. You, you can always add write debug statements to your code without pain. It doesn't cost you much, but it'll give you lots of opportunities. And when you do this, you can use the global prefix and variables to get sample content, dr like, like draw a sample from while your script runs, because global variables have eternal life. And so after the script is ended, you'll always find these things in your global variables. Who of you uses write debug at all? Okay, wonderful. So, one of the things that is new <coughs> in Article 5 would be that you can now start to break into the debugger while you're running a script. Previously, and we're talking about breakpoints in a minute, you had to decide whether you wanted to debug a script before you started it. So you had to set breakpoints, and then you had to run your script, and when the breakpoints were hit, then you could enter the debugger and enjoy stepping. With PowerShell 5, it's different. Here's a script. Let's uh, just take a look at it, what it does. It's really a dumb script. It's, it has a, a loop, and it's writing 10,000 numbers into a, a file, and it waits one second so that it isn't done too far, too quickly. So when I run this, I now, once I, I started it, would have no control anymore over the debugger because I didn't set any breakpoints. In PowerShell 5, um, as you can see down here in the status bar, you can press Control B. Control B is a new uh, shortcut, so when I co uh, press Control B, you'll see what happens. I'm immediately stopping at the current uh, location where that script was executing code. And from there, I can take it with the um, typical stepping commands uh, you can either use the GUI for that, or the function keys, or you can always, when you are in the debugger, press a question mark, or enter a question mark, and then, you, then you'll get the debugging commands. So if you wanted to step, you could simply enter S for stepping, or V or O for step over and step out. So if I step now, S, you see how that thing steps through the code? And if you wanted to, you could, of course, <coughs> any kind of uh, monitoring device. Okay, this is very tiny, I must admit. Let's see if I can change that a little bit. Okay. It's a resolution problem here because I switched the resolution. Now I'm probably not getting it much larger. And then you can simply step as long as you want to, or you can say I detach 
detach the, the debugger, detach. <coughs> and then the script would continue to run. Or you can say quit. When you say quit instead of detach, then the script would break, <coughs> would stop. Ad hoc debugging is something that you can invoke uh, by pressing Control V, but you can also have a script enter the debugger whenever you want to. And that's very useful if you're sending a script, let's say to a remote job or anywhere, then you may not be able to press Control V. In this case, you can simply use this statement, wait debugger. Simply say wait debugger in a script and whenever PowerShell hits that line, it'll do the same as if you had pressed Control V. So now this is the next next command after wait debugger. It automatically stopped there. I didn't do anything. And just assume you're sending that script maybe to a remote uh, computer, then it would stop on the remote computer and wait for the debugger to be attached. That is going to be important in a minute. So dynamic debugger invocation means you have two choices. You can press Control B or you can run wait debugger from inside of your code. In any um, respect, PowerShell will stop and the debugger will show the code where you are at that current situation. <coughs> now let's take a look at a use case with a normal breakpoints first. Let's assume, or let's take a look at this function. Again, this is a summit. These are not the traditional kind of presentations. We want you to engage and to not doze away in the morning. So here is a little function that is not the best way of doing this. It's simply um, a little brain teaser. What is this going to do? Or what is, what is the intention of this piece of code? <coughs> Yeah, pinging some computer using that old-fashioned ping exit, which is, by the way, the great thing about PowerShell that you can use exes with all your code. And then it is checking whether there is a line with zero percent, zero percent loss, would mean, okay, I got a, uh, I got an answer. And not let's check out what happened here if the results are what you expected. Let's run this one first. This one returns one line. This one returns true. What's wrong here? Why is this thing returning a text line, whereas this one returns a bool, bool uh, value to a false? One way of finding this out, if you just think this is not a, a small function, it would be a real big, large script, would be really to now start setting breakpoints. And you always <coughs> use breakpoints when you want to debug. Let's start with the simple breakpoints, the line breakpoints. Um, you can simply click a line and run it again to see what is actually happening inside of that piece of code. Let's run this one again. Here it is. So now I'm exactly at that position. The debugger is still running, so I'm still in the middle of that script. And now I can inspect all the variables, either by hovering over the variables, if there's anything in there, or even better, by simply outputting that. So this is what's in result right now. So if I run this, uh, I want to run this. Yeah, that's right, F8. <laughs> so if I run this, I get back the line with the 0%. But now, why is this line not producing true or false? If it's many lines. Yeah, is, isn't that not now? Mm -hmm. You have an array of, of the, to the left of the... Exactly. Of it is the same thing with the UNC path where you have to know that PowerShell always requires a, a drive letter to find the right provider. Here it's that you always need to know with PowerShell that the comparison operator acts differently depending on whether this is an array or not. <coughs> if it's an array, it's acting like a filter and you get only the elements that pass that test. If it's not an array, it's a bool uh, result true and false. So in this case, if we look at it, the result is really an array. Yes, 
So that's basically <coughs> the problem here, and you could correct that logical error by simply using, if it's an array, you always have count, whoops, sorry, again, the presentation mode. It's nice, the presentation mode, but uh, don't edit your scripts while you are in presentation mode. Count, so if, um, if I get more, li more than zero lines, that would be the correction. Now it's an array. Now it's an array for sure. <laughs> Uh, and this one would now always work. So setting breakpoints is an, an initial first good step of finding things if you know approximately where the error could be because you need to set a line breakpoint into a given line. In fact, you can do that um, with the set here's breakpoint command looks just as if you would use the UI. It's a feature of the underlying PowerShell debugging mechanism. And um, you can submit for a breakpoint your own action. Your action could be an arbitrary script block. If you don't submit an action, you always break. If you do submit an action, you can do fun things. Let's uh, take a look at this thing here. Uh, take, take these down here, that's even better. Here I set a breakpoint with an action. In this case, I'm not setting a line breakpoint. Line breakpoints are the ones that you set with the UI, but I'm setting a <coughs> variable breakpoint. A breakpoint that breaks whenever this variable A changes. And when it changes, <coughs> it is supposed to say something and to be. And down here, you can see a conditional breakpoint that would be the same thing, except that now in your script block, you test whatever <coughs> your condition is, and only if that condition is met, do you call break by by your, your code if you want to break. Let's check it out. I, is it change or access? This right now is the change. change. If you want to have more control, the question is, is this, oh, let's first play with it. So I'm running these two, and now they all targeted the variable A. So I say A, I don't get a breakpoint because it's a read process. Now I say A equals one, A is changed. By the way, it even would beep if I turned it on. Okay. So now it changed. Oops. And um, if I change it over 10, I get two hits because now the other, the conditional breakpoint, also triggered. Um, this was this condition. If A equal uh, greater than 10, do something. In this case, I did not enter the debugging mode. I was not really breaking, I was simply executing code. Mm -hmm. I'm simply outputting stuff here. I could have also made the debugger break by using the statement break. So if I wanted to break, all I needed to do would be to take this line and then to say if, if A is equals, let's say if it's, if it's greater than 20, then I want to break. Okay, let's add that to the whole enchilada. A equals 20, or let's take 19. I have these two, then I take 21. And now I'm exactly in that debugging mode. As you can see in IC starts, you would see a blue bubble. That's because it's a dynamic breakpoint, but um, in normal IC, it would, it, would also, it would also stop at that position. And you can now uh, decide what you want to do in your code. Now, breakpoints, variable breakpoints, can also trigger on read. It depends on what you want to do. If you take a look at the command that set ps breakpoint, you can see what you can do. You have an action that is your script block that should be execute when the when the breakpoint hits is hit. If you leave that action blank, then you always get a break on default. And then you have the line breakpoint. That's the type of breakpoints that you set to a given line in a given script. That's the traditional breakpoint. I used the variable breakpoint, so if I do that again, I take a variable breakpoint on variable i, and then you can choose what kind of mode you want to use. Read, write, or read, write. That depends on exactly what you want to do. I now do, do it on read. <coughs> and as an action block, I'm simply saying write host i changed foreground yellow because I want to sh show you something that um, can be a problem with a breakpoint like that. Just go over here. Oh, 
I think the problem already occurred. <laughs> if you set a variable breakpoint without scoping it to a script, then weird things can happen. Like you can see here, I think this is frozen. I have to restart that in a second. The problem is um, your script or your breakpoint would trigger now whenever someone would read that variable. And that happens more often than you think. For example, if you do IntelliSense, if you have to complete a variable list without even choosing that variable, PowerShell is querying all the variables, what variables do I have, and that already triggers your breakpoint. So you can get into catch-22 situations like this one. That's what I think happened here. Uh, okay. In my other script where I put that line, I have a big note in there in the comment. Don't do this in presentation. <laughs> 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 Start over again. Okay. <coughs> what is the problem? No. Okay. And um, <coughs> the, uh, the third type of, of breakpoint that I'm going to, to show to you, that is uh, the command breakpoint. And when you look back at the first script that I showed you with the right debug statement. Some of you may, may have thought, what is what <coughs> you talking about? Write debug, that, that's old school. We don't need to talk about that. But when you write debug, when you add write debug statements to your script, you can easily turn them into real breakpoints. <coughs> yeah, question? I, I, no, I think you should make a quick note about steroids because I don't think everybody knows. Uh, who knows? I see steroids? Who doesn't, doesn't, who doesn't <laughs> know? <laughs> yeah. uh, so it is basically an extension to the IC editor. But thanks for That you have written. Yes, yes. that's true. <laughs> That's true, my little baby. <laughs> so here I write debug statements. When I run this script now, you will see that none of those are visible. And I have an error in this script. So I, all I get back is this. That is not really nice. Now the first thing would be to enable debugging. Debug on. Debug on is simply a function that sets the debug preference to continue. So I'm going to run this again. I now better understand what's, what's the what the script is doing because I get better information of where the script encountered what. And if I wanted to debug it now with a breakpoint uh, system, I could say set ps breakpoint command write debug. So I simply want the debugger to stop at each instance of when it calls write debug. I could provide an action in a script, but I don't. Oh, better. Well, better provide a script again. That's always a, a good practice. With breakpoints, make sure you tie that to a given script. Because again, you never know who else <coughs> used write debug in a script block or something like that. So the script here would be my pipe psive current file home path. That's the path of that script. So when I run it now, you see what happens. <coughs> I again get write debug statements, but now the debugger is invoked and it stops at all the write debug statements and you can now step or you can continue to the next write debug statement or step again or again continue to the next debug statement if there is one. So it's simply a command breakpoint that enables you to do lots of new things. Either turn write debug into a breakpoint or if you submit an action script block you could not break at all, but instead just count the frequency of how often a function is called. So if you take all of your functions and create breakpoints, action breakpoints for the command name of the function, then at the end of a script, you would exactly know which parts of my code have been hit how many times. Could be useful. Okay. Now, there's one more thing. Um, tomorrow I have a talk about AST and tokenization. And um, when you know how you get to the uh, parser, to the PowerShell parser, you can do a lots of interesting things with write debug. That's why I think it, it deserves attention. For example, I can uh, then have a command that's called enable write debug breakpoints. And when I run this, I get real breakpoints, as you have seen here. So the parser is simply asked, where are my write debug statements? And then your code can choose to insert line breakpoints at these locations. 
Or I could say I want this, but only where I have a verbose switch. So I can have write debug statements, but in certain situations, I don't want a breakpoint. So these these breakpoints would all, all only apply to verbose. Well, is, is that something you did only to be able to hook it with the parser, or does it change the write debug statements? If you if you the, the idea is this: if you have a script, you may want to have persisting breakpoints. So you want to s set breakpoints in lines, and then when you save your script or give it to a colleague you still want that person to be able to re-enable those breakpoints. And when you enter or when you add write debug statements to your script, then that doesn't hurt the script. It runs in production, it's no problem at all. But you have the ability with these tools, and these are simple partial functions that you get, to sort of turn on or turn off the scripting or breakpoint functionality whenever you need it. Um, and there's even more, if you, if you wanted to, like but that's, say that, that's a function you, you have written. Right. Yeah, that's a function oh. I'm covering in detail tomorrow oh, in the okay. AST session. It's simply three lines, four lines of code that is tapping into the PowerShell parser because it needs to know where are my write debug statements because I need to know where are the lines where I can set the breakpoint. So that's going to be interesting. So AST is not just boring theoretical stuff. It, it, it can create great tools. And one <coughs> additional thing is with write debug, although it is silent, in production scripts, <coughs> you may still have a problem if someone that runs your script code that has write debug statements in it discovers the minus debug common parameter. Because if the person does that and it's not very partial proficient, it will be faced with always popping up messages, do you want to execute this, do you want to execute this, because the debug uh, common parameter would turn each of these statements into inquiries where partial would always ask. So a safe way would be to disable write debug when you Im when you ship your script. And there is another another little function that's called disable write debug, which would okay. You can never change anything in the ISE if there are breakpoints. So you have to clear breakpoints if you want to change things. Oh, there's still breakpoints in there. Let's see what breakpoints I have. now. That's what I want to show. So you can just go through your script and disable or comment out certain parts of your script. <coughs> and then when you're ready to debug, you can simply say enable write debug. And then this would be undone. So you can yeah, create interesting add on commands to um, streamline your debugging process. That was the traditional type of debugger. Um, now let's take a look at run space debugging. The traditional type of debugging is really that you have a process. Inside of that process is a run space. The run space is simply a place where PowerShell code can live. <coughs> and so when you simply set breakpoints and not care about anything else, then you're always debugging your own local script. Now let's take a look at other things that you can do. And I'm starting another fresh PowerShell eyes <coughs> just to show you one thing. In PowerShell 5, when you say get run space, you get this. This is basically access to your run space, to your internal PowerShell inside of your ISE process. If you added another PowerShell tab like this, and went back and called that again, then you have two run spaces. So ISE, for example, is a, yeah, is a, a program that can have arbitrary numbers of run spaces. And uh, if you want to debug something, you can simply choose now in PowerShell 5 the run space that you would like to access. And that's exactly what I'm going to do now. Tobias, yes. in ISE, don't do more than 32 run spaces. Yeah, <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Don't do more than 32 run spaces. Also, if, when you do out grid view, always remember that there is a hidden limitation with 30 columns. So if you pipe something to out grid view, we're talking about limits. And data is missing, then take a look at your numbers of columns. Maybe it's too much. This is what I'm doing to, to start a new run space. I'm not starting a new run space inside my ISD because the more practical approach would be to have that run space in a different process. Let's assume you have a background job or let's assume you have a scheduled task that someone else set up every Friday <coughs> at six o'clock at night. It's running under a different account. 
but it doesn't do, it is not doing what you want. So how can you debug these things? So I'm simply for illustration purposes now launching a plain PowerShell and it's simply counting again so that I have time to show you what I need to do to get into that process. I need the process ID, oh that's a funny process ID, 32. Um, I need the process ID <laughs> to connect to that process. Uh, so that's what I'm doing here. So now you can see down here, I'm, pro I'm, I'm connected with that process. So you can see it from the back. It says process MPID 32. So I'm now actually in that process, but that process doesn't care. It's still running. So let's take a look in, um, in at the run spaces inside of that process. And there are two run spaces. One is busy, one, one is available. And I want to connect to the running run space. Debug run space ID 1. And now, did you see that? Isn't that magic? It's a different PowerShell, and the code that is running in that different PowerShell is transmitted over to my IAC. I'm seeing now the source code that is executing in my schedule task or whatever it is on the other side. And not only that, I also see where I am. I can step either with the uh, regular controls or with the uh, debugging controls that you have when you enter the question mark, like I showed before. So I can simply step through my remote code and now take a look at the loop. This is my code, it's now halted, it's not running anymore because it's in debug mode, which is cool. And now <coughs> see what's happening. This is my remote PowerShell, now I am in my remote PowerShell, so I say CLS. What does CLS mean? But it is not clear in my screen, it's clear in that this one. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm basically in that <coughs> other process. And um, I can now look at all the variables. This would be my iteration, 59. Now let's change that to i equals uh, 9980. And then <coughs> detach. Detach means I go away and leave the process alone. So I say detach. And 9980. It's simply <laughs> continuing where I have left it off. That's amazing because this way you can really have great control over processes that you don't really control that are not running in your ISE. Basically, what the fun thing you can do, I can't do it here because of time constraints, a fun thing you can do is simply set up a scheduled task that is running a PowerShell script and then put it under the system account and run it. As an administrator, you can launch that um, scheduled task and then hook up that process with this way so that you sort of can debug that uh, system process and you have a console with system rights. That's perfect. In that context now. So yes, for which version is this? Available? That's PowerShell 5. Only for 5. That's anything that goes beyond the, the, the local run space that I'm showing here would be PowerShell mm -hmm. 5. Can you also use that for sessions that have been invoked from that box from another? Yes. So yes. Yes, I'm going to show that. The problem today is really with PowerShell. PowerShell can be everywhere. It's not only in front of your face. It could be in a DSC configuration. It can be in a, on a remote session. It can be in a job. It can be in a different PowerShell. SCCM can execute it. Whoever can execute it. And all of these, all of these locations can now be debugged. And let's just check, check out how that works. Um, here's a script that you get that I'm not running right now. This would be simply creating a scheduled task, and I would show you exactly the same thing. So I'm skipping this example. It doesn't matter whether you interactively um, launch a script or with a scheduled task. With a scheduled task, you probably wouldn't see the window anymore because it's hidden, but you would still see the source code inside of ISE while you debug that. Now debug a remote session. Debugging a remote session, there are multiple ways of how you can do this, but Always remember you have PS Edit. PS Edit is your friend because it's it's doing all the heavy lifting. Um, I'm showing you one of many options how you can debug things on a remote side first. One would be to enter a, a remote session. In this case, I'm remoting to myself. Now I am. Oh, I was remoting from that process. <laughs> but I'm, I was out there anyway. Okay. <coughs> yeah, sometimes it's getting hard to understand where exactly am I now. <laughs> 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 okay, so 
okay, now I'm in on my own computer in a remote session, and now I'm running this PS Edit. PS Edit. Who who has used PS Edit before? It is a great built-in command in ISC that lets you load a, a script file from the remote side <coughs> into your local ISC. So I'm now just imagine this one runs now on the remote side, even though that's my same computer. So it is basically, it takes um, a couple of seconds, it's now loading that script, temp sample, uh, PS1, into my own machine. And this is my script code. That is basically here, remote file on the remote side. So if I wanted to debug that now on the remote side, all I could do would be to set breakpoints, just as if that was a local script. And to make sure that it is really running on the local uh, on the uh, remote side, I am invoking it from here too. And as you can see, I'm in the debugger. I'm now stepping through the remote script, wherever that is. I can see what's happening down here. I have the same debugger uh, shortcut commands. So if I enter a question mark here. I can also step with an S or quit or detach. Here's one useful command in the debugger. In this case, I have the source code available because I launched a script that was a file that ISD could see. Sometimes you don't have the source code available. Let's say you're debugging a script block, something that you didn't send over as a physical file. In this case, you can always call L. L would give you the source code you are debugging. And then you can see with a little star where you are right now. So that is like, it's a little bit like an old fashioned navigation system. <laughs> it, it'll work for most instances. So now I am running through that script. I can detach again. Okay, now the script would hit the next breakpoint. So I'm stopping that and uh, exiting my session. Remote debugging, that's one way of how you can do this. Another way would be to enter your PS session and then use set PS breakpoint to set all the breakpoints that you want and then run your script. You can do that as well. Or you can use in PowerShell 5 the new wait debugger. So you take your script, the first line that you put in is wait, wait debugger, then you run your script and you end up in your debugger. And the same is true for, for background jobs as well. Here's a background job. It's, you, s you see the pattern, huh? I'm always using that loop. <laughs> so in this case, I'm taking a script block. And now you'll see what I mean, what happens when you don't <coughs> get a physical file, but a script block. I'm taking that script block, sending it over to the job, and then I'm debugging the job. So this is first creating the job. And now I want to debug it. And here's a new command, debug job. Debug job basically does all the heavy lifting for you. It identifies the process, the PowerShell XE that is ex actually executing your background job, and then does the enter PS host stuff. So when I run this, here I am. You don't see any change in the editor. You only see it down here because there is no physical script. This is a script block. So in this case, you really would need to use the, 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 the text-based interface I can do an L for Lisp. This is my script block. I can step inside of my script block and Lisp, step, Lisp, and now I'm one line uh, deeper down in my code. And I can say detach or quit. Detach means continue the script block. Quit means. Can you set a breakpoint on line five where when you don't have lines? Yeah, or like yeah. set PS breakpoint line. Well, it could be a problem because it's not a physical script, yeah, so that doesn't work. Okay, so it doesn't work. Quick. But there is a trick that you can use. If you want to debug a, a background job, simply make sure that PowerShell gets a real file from you. This is what you would do. That's all you do. You keep the, the script external as a script file, and then in your script block, you're simply calling the physical file. That's, when you think about it, it's not bad. Instead of putting your code into a script block right away, you simply, the main thing is that you have a path. Now let's see how this behaves. It's the same thing again, creating that job, and now I'm calling that job. And now I get all the luxury of seeing my code, getting the highlighted line. This is basically my background job executing now. Um, because I have a physical file and then IC knows what to display. 
So you see here, down here, I'm in debug mode, job five, and still it's like feeling like if I was debugging a local script. <coughs> Finally, you can also debug DSC. Who of you is doing de de large step configuration? Okay. I'm only giving you a quick, quick intro how DSC debugging fits into that framework and then uh, want to point you to the session on Wednesday, two to three, <coughs> by Hermann and Mark, you are showing DC debugging in, yes, in, now in reality. <laughs> now you don't have to do it. But how, that, how does it work? It's basically the same thing. You are telling DSC to, de to use the debug mode resource skip break off. That's all you need to do in preparation. Then you start your configuration and then the DSC will emit messages to you that look similar to what you see here, down here. So DSC is actively <coughs> telling you to enter PS session onto the remote machine that you are configuring, enter to the PS multi process with the given ID that the DSC is running in, <coughs> and then enter the run space that DSC is using to, to apply the co configuration. <coughs> so it's really not a different animal. It's the same animal, the same thing we're talking about the ability of PowerShell to connect to different processes across remoting and then to pick any run space you want that is living in a given process. Mm -hmm. And it's useful all over the place. One of the last things where this uh, philosophy can be seen would be this. Let me see this one. Has any one of you worked with the PowerShell class at all? Basically, this is the, the minimum code that you need to open up your own run space. And you can use that to um, create multi-threaded PowerShell. So when you do that, multi-threaded PowerShell, you have different run spaces in one process, in one ISD or whatever host you use. So if <coughs> I take this here, I could run this. I could run this code. This code would uh, run 10,000 times. It would beep every second and it would try and output things to the host. Now the beeping works, but the outputting doesn't work. So how can I debug this? How can I find out why it's not outputting the number? Let's first kill it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now let's do it again. Okay. And now I'm using this to enter that uh, run space. Okay, there I am. I am now inside of this process. Since I did not submit the physical file, I again get this um, text-based debugger. But when I type in L, I see this is going to, this is happening here. I am now in my other run space. I am in that second PowerShell thread. So I can try and see why is it not outputting things. Hello? works in this session, it doesn't work in the other session. So the, 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 the reason is, right host is specific to the host. It's writing to the other host, but the other host is invisible, so I can't write to it. <coughs> Let's get out of here. Okay. And uh, because time is running out, I'm showing you the solution that you could come up with when you do debugging of these things. This would be the solution to it, to have a background uh, PowerShell that has access to the foreground PowerShell in outputting. You would, in your code, have a parameter where you can submit the UI, and then you would submit your foreground UI to the background process, and that way you can, from the background process, write to the foreground process. You get all this code. Here's simply a use case. Here's a start progress bar and a stop <coughs> progress bar. And here's what it does, start progress bar, when I do that, start progress <coughs> bar would do nothing, oh, I need to run it first, because I have another start progress bar someplace. Start progress bar would simply write dots and beep while your foreground is still active. You can do whatever you want. It's kind of hard now to do whatever you want, but it, it's still doable. <laughs> okay, now it's eventually stopping. Okay. <laughs> the, the use case would be something like this. You have a 
a long running command and you want your users to, to understand that PowerShell is still active doing something. So this way you could start progress bar while your command is running and emitting whatever you want. You don't need to have a beep beeping. And the finally part is only important if someone breaks this by pressing control C so that in the finally part the, 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 the dot bar is stopped. So when I run this now, you can see what happens. It is beeping in the, in the foreground while it is recursively searching my whole uh, Windows folder and then it found 1099 PowerShell scripts and the user didn't have to wait in confusion and didn't know if PowerShell hang, was hanging or, or not. Tobias, I seem to remember a video on YouTube from you six or eight years ago. <coughs> well, that's basically this. That's true, but without debugging. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and also, back then, the example was doing it the other way around, because at that time, I didn't know how to write from the backgrounds in the foreground. So you were sort of putting your command in the background, which has the disadvantage of having to get the results back to the foreground. Anyway. <laughs> So this was a trip that started with um, simple debugging techniques, emitting diagnostic data using write debug. And I already scratched a little bit the surface. Uh, I'm summarizing. <laughs> I scratched a little bit the, the surface by t showing you that write debug can be much more than just a lame text output. You can use it as a yeah, anchor to later on, whenever you want to, turn that into a breakpoint, enable it, disable it, whatever you want to do. Then we have... Uh, taking a look at the breakpoint system where the PowerShell debugger actively can monitor your code. And you have three different breakpoints. You have a line breakpoint, a variable breakpoint, and a command breakpoint. And then you can choose what you want to happen. If you don't choose any action, then PowerShell breaks, and you get a stop. And you can choose what you want to do manually. If you provide a script block, then it's up to you. You can create conditional breakpoints, or you can create logging breakpoints, whatever you want to do. Uh, and then we have seen how PowerShell 5 takes this concept <coughs> from one run space to all the run spaces that are there, whether it's in the same process or in another process with the uh, enter PS host process, you can always switch to another process and you can do the same thing via remote. So my time is almost one second up. I hope you enjoyed that a little bit. Um, I'm open for questions outside. Thanks for your time. And